Good morning, good morning, good morning, Central Square Church. Yes, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. If you don't know who I am, my name is Mark August. I'm one of the members here at Central Square Church. I'm also a part of the teaching team, and I want to welcome you. I want to welcome all of you to this morning's online service. I'm going to be your presider this morning. Um, and again, just feel free to sit back, relax, but at the same time, get ready to engage the Lord Jesus, get ready to just be in his presence this morning. We're thankful that we get to still uh, rally around the fact that he said that he is who he says he is. Um, and so with that being said, I'm just going to spark us off with a quick word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your characteristics, your attributes. We thank you, Lord God, that you are truly in a class by yourself and in a league of your own. And because of that, we get to rally around that truth and rally around the fact that you are who you say you are. And that is the greatest gift that we could ever receive, Lord. I pray, Lord God, that you would move the way you want to move, Lord God, this morning, uh, that you would say what you want to say in this service and just um, communicate something dope, Lord Father God, to whoever needs to hear it. Um, and we're just excited to be your people. We love you and we pray these things, not because we're worthy, but in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. So with that being said, I'm going to pass it over to the worship team so that we can spend some time in musical worship.
right. Welcome again. Welcome again, Central Square Church. Please, please feel free to greet one another in the chat. Uh, and also, as an as a quick icebreaker question, you know, uh, we can see that, you know, this pandemic is starting to decline just a little bit. Um, and, you know, as of I mean, I really can't say anything about other states, but Massachusetts is beginning to open back up. Uh, what's one thing that you look forward to doing once everything is open back up 100 percent? Just something for you to think about. That's just the icebreaker question. Right now, I just have a few quick announcements for us for this week. Um, all the details on these can be found on the bulletin that's on our website. Uh, so if you know you need to refer back to it, uh, you know, you know, head there and all the details will be there. Uh, and if you're new uh, and you want to learn more about our church or if anybody has any prayer requests, please feel free to fill out the virtual welcome card that's in the bulletin. Um, you don't have to be a member of this church for us to pray for you. Uh, so first announcement is the Central Square Church one year celebration. Um, our church is going to be a year old in a couple of weeks since the merger happened. And it's definitely something to celebrate. So please come celebrate with us at Dana Park on Sunday. June 20th at 11 a.m. We're going to have a nice fried chicken picnic. If you're new here, you can learn more about our about the story of the church merger at uh, greaterthingstogether.org. Second announcement, summer events. Summer is here. Personally, my favorite season of the year. Summer's here. And we're looking forward to many ways of getting connected. Get ready for outdoor fellowship time every Sunday church work days to help us move into our renovated building. That's definitely going to be exciting. Um, and a one day summer retreat. And we ain't forget about the kids either. For the kids, uh, we're excited to offer some fun summer challenges, soccer nights, and good old traditional VBS, Vacation Bible School. Um, learn more at csquare.church slash summer and stay tuned for more details coming very soon. Good morning, kids. My name is Lan, and I am a member of Central Square Church. I'm here to bring you a surprise. Can you guess what it is for my t-shirts? I hear soccer nights. Correct! We are the soccer nights leadership team, and we're so excited to bring the program back this summer. Hi church, my name is Caroline. Uh, I've been running Soccer Nights for the past four years. Uh, for those of you who've never heard of Soccer Nights, um, it's one of our longest running outreach programs at CSC. Um, this was actually our 13th year. And in the before times, what we did is we had kids ages 5 to 12 out in Senate Park, um, and we taught them how to play soccer uh, for a week. Um, it was a lot of fun. It was a great way for us as a church community to interact um, with the Central Square community and it's become a really good mainstay um, of our, our church and also Central Square. Uh, and last year during the pandemic we delivered care packages to the kids as a way to stay engaged with the community. And this year we're really excited that we'll be able to be back in person at a new field uh, and David will tell you a little bit more about that. Hi Central Square Church. So we're really excited to be bringing Soccer Nights back this year. You know, it's been a long time since we've been able to come together as a church, serve each other and the community at the same time. And it's gonna be great to do it this summer. So a few important details first. First of all, Soccer Nights is gonna be a little later this summer. We're gonna be going from July 12th through the 15th. Um, volunteers, we're gonna ask you to be there from 5 p.m. to 8.30ish, families, and kids, we're looking at having you there from 6 p.m. 
to 8 p.m. Uh, we are going to be at Hoyt Field this year, so please note the change of location. We've sent out some information, um, an interest form asking if you're looking at coming, um, and so please check your emails about that. If you haven't received it, um, let us know. Reach out to us at soccernights1 at gmail.com. Um, got the email address right here and we'll send that along to you. We're working really closely at the City of Cambridge to make sure that we're doing everything that we need to do to keep everyone safe. So we're really excited, looking forward to seeing you there. Keep an eye out for more information, especially as we ask for volunteers, and we will see you this summer. Right now we will transition to a time of offering, um, a time for us to worship the Lord with our pockets uh, and our resources. I just want to remind us once again that giving is another important and tangible way for us to offer our hearts worship to God in God's eyes. Uh, our giving and our gratitude are always tied together. Um, we are called to give and called to sacrifice, but always called to do so out of a sense of uh, true joyfulness and genuine thankfulness. And we can only give freely when we realize that we've already been given so much. Um, just going to give us all a moment now just to come before God and to say thank you and to give. But let's remember to do so in a way that reflects our heart's joy and our heart's thankfulness. Let's pray for our offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you for both gift and giver. We thank you, Lord God, that we are able to give. We thank you that we have resources and that we have ways to acquire those resources. We don't take that lightly. And in giving, uh, we offer our hearts worship to you, Lord Father God, with our resources. I pray, Lord Father God, that the gifts that are given today would be sown in a good ground and that would be you that they would be used to advance your kingdom, Lord God, to further your kingdom agenda uh, and to ultimately just have the role of financing kingdom business and financing the things of God and financing all the things that you've laid on our heart for us to do so that we can not only um, bring the gospel to those who may not know, but to also edify one another. We thank you, Lord Father God, for even this opportunity to give. I pray, Lord Father God, that those who can't give or 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 don't have enough to give, Lord God, that you would bless them so that they can do so uh, next time. And even those who do give, bless them as well, Lord Father God, because they are giving out of a sense of their own joyfulness and thankfulness and doing it cheerfully and willingly. We love you. We pray, Lord God, that you bless this seed that's being sown in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, Jerlika and Jeff bring their child to the Church for the Sacrament of Holy Baptism. We rejoice in God's promises to those taking this significant step of faith. All right. So Jerlika and Jeff, I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and you're going to respond by saying, we do. You ready? Do you desire that your child be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? If so, say, we do. Proclaiming this covenant with Jesus Christ, do you renounce all the powers of evil and declare your opposition to a way of life in contradiction to the gospel? If so, say, we do. We do. Relying on God's grace, do you promise to teach the word of God to your child, to pray for her in every way that she may become a true disciple of Jesus Christ? If so, say, we do. 
and empowered by the Holy Spirit, do you promise to enable your child to participate fully in the life of the local body of Christ, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God? If so, say, we do. We do. Excellent. I'm now going to have a question for your sponsors. So your sponsors, I'm going to have you uh, join them on the stage, please. All right. So as sponsors, will you promise to pray for and support Jeff and Jerlika in the promises that they have made, as well as to pray for and help this child to confess the Christian faith as her own? If so, say, we will. Excellent. The final question is for everybody who is here in this room. Nettie, it's for you as well, and for everybody who's tuning in online. The Christian nurture of Zora cannot be assumed by the parents alone. Since we are members of one another in the fellowship of the church, the responsibility of caring for the newly baptized must be shared by all. In receiving and caring for Zora, will you as members of the Church of Jesus Christ do your part by word and deed with love and prayer to guide and nurture Nora, uh, Zora, <laughs> encouraging her to know and follow Christ, caring for her as Christ's own? If so, everybody say, or you can type, with God's help we will. With God's help we will. Amen. 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 Let us pray together. God, we thank you for the waters of baptism. In it, we are buried with Christ in his death. By it, we share in his resurrection. Through it, we are renewed by the Holy Spirit. There, in joyful obedience to your Son, we bring his fellowship, those who come to him in faith, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We pray, God, that you would sanctify this water. We pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that this child of yours may continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ, our Savior. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen and amen. Amen. So Zora, do I come to you? Yeah. All right. Hey, Zora. <laughs> Hi, Zora. Okay, ready, Zora? Zora, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Amen. 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 Yay! Yay. Yay. Good, girl. Good girl. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the waters of baptism. And Father, we thank you for the life of Zora. And we pray, God, that as she has been baptized, we pray that you would now receive her protect her, walk with her, speak to her. We pray, God, that you would empower Jeff and Jerlika to do everything that they need to do to raise Zora in the faith. But God, we pray that even now, at this very, very young age, that Zora would know that there is a God who loves her and will walk with her all the days of her life. We pray this, Lord, in your name. Amen. Through the covenant of grace, Zora is now received into the nurture and care of the Christian church. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. Amen. Amen. Congrats. You did it. Good job, Zora.
Good morning, Central Square Church. My name is Pastor Larry. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and it is so great to be with you here this morning. And what a great way to start the morning, by baptizing baby Zora. And I don't know if you could see it on the video, but she was talking to me through the entire baptism ceremony. And when I said her name wrong, she was correcting me off to the side. That was awesome. It was an amazing moment. And so congratulations uh, to Jeff and Jerlika and baby Zora. Today we are uh, continuing and closing out our sermon series in the book of Psalms. The Psalms, what we've been saying, they are unlike any other book in the Bible because it's poetry and song lyrics and, and it has a way of getting underneath our skin and, and into our hearts and souls in a very unique way. You know Dietrich Bonhoeffer, two years before he would be executed for resisting and, and seeking to overthrow the Nazi government, he wrote a letter to his parents in jail. And in it, he said, I read the Psalms every day as I have done for years. I know them and love them more than any other book. So the Psalms are special. And I pray that even as we close out this series, that you would continue to read and reread the Psalms all the days of your life. Today, we are in Psalm 131, which is one of the shorter Psalms, but packed with meaning. And our, and our teaching today will come to us from one of our pastors, Gene Shim. And if you've never heard Pastor Jean preach before, you are in for a treat. She is an incredible preacher. May God speak to you clearly and powerfully this morning through the preached word of God. For one last time, welcome back to our sermon series. This is Redemption Song. Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jean, and I'm one of the pastors here at this church. It is an honor and pleasure to bring God's word this morning. Last week, we celebrated my oldest son's fifth birthday, and my middle son, Zeke, who is two and a half, has been saying since then, I'm so excited, my birthday. Or in his toddler voice, I'm so excited, my birthday because he saw my oldest son's birthday filled with cake and presents and balloons, and he got a glimpse of what his future birthday was gonna be like. So it doesn't matter that I tell him like, hey Z, your birthday's not for another 160 sleeps. He doesn't care. The anticipation for the future gives him excitement in the present moment. But when he only focuses on a future birthday, he's missing out on the joy and satisfaction of today, of being present with his family and enjoying the things that he already has. Our anticipation for the future absolutely gives us hope, right? It gives us hope in the present as we wait for what's to come. But in this pandemic, we've been waiting and anticipating for almost over a, for over a year, right? At first it was like, oh, just wait two weeks. Then it was like, okay, till the end of the summer. Then it was till spring, then it's tomorrow. And it seems like it's so close and it, we're pretty much coming out of the pandemic, but we've been anticipating for a year and it has been exhausting. Anticipation is vital to our faith, but sometimes we don't need just anticipation. 
We also need satisfaction today. We need both. And in today's passage, I want to focus on the present satisfaction we can have in God that gives us hope in this moment at this time. So let's read our passage, which comes from Psalm 131. It says, A song of ascents of David. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have calmed and quieted myself. I'm like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and and forevermore. At the beginning of this psalm, there's a note at the top that says this is a song of ascents. Uh, there are 15 psalms in the Bible that fit this category and have this title, and it's most likely that these were psalms sung by pilgrims as they journeyed to, Jer to Jerusalem for one of the required festivals, or it was sung by priests as they climbed up the 15 steps to the temple. Either way, these songs were sung for the singer and the worshiper to prepare their hearts for worship and to go to the temple where the presence of God was. And it's helpful to look at our passage, Psalm 131, in the context of Psalm 130, which comes right before it. Because both of these psalms end with, Israel, put your hope in the Lord. They're both about putting our hope in God. And Psalm 130 is about waiting for the Lord. And it ends with verses 7 through 8, which says, Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Here, the hope in the Lord is on the future anticipation of God's work and redemption of his people. It's in the hope, in the promises of God that would be fulfilled. And this hope is absolutely foundational to our faith. Right? We hope in the promises of God, knowing that it will come to fruition. We hope in the second coming of Christ, and we hope for the redemption and renewal in this world. And we hope for these things because they are guaranteed to come. But what about today? What about the present moment right now? In our passage in Psalm 101, verse 3, it says, Israel, put your hope in the Lord. And then it finishes with now, both now and forevermore now and for eternity. In today's psalm, the hope isn't based on what the Lord will do and all of his mighty works, but it is on a hope that we don't wait on, but rather something that is available now, here and today, by being satisfied with the Lord's presence, no matter what is going around us or what we're going through. And we know this because we're given the image of a weaned child in verse 2. A weaned child is a child that has learned to stop nursing from its mother's breasts, right? And there's a big difference between a child who is in the process of being weaned and one that has already weaned. When I weaned my first child, uh, he knew how to eat solid food, but he loved to nurse. And when I began the weaning process, he was so angry and fussy because he wasn't getting what he wanted from me. All right, and there was a time that when I would hold him, he would be just pulling at my shirt and grabbing at me, trying to nurse. And he came to me because he wanted something from me. But once he was weaned, I was able to hold him peacefully and he was able to just rest in my arms. And he was no longer interested in what he could get from me, but he was completely satisfied and content with my presence, right? It was no longer the milk that he sought after, but it was me that gave him contentment and peace. A weaned child is an image of a person filled with satisfaction and contentment. And it's also a description of what we can experience in our relationship with the Lord. I look at my children and it always amazes me how much they love to be in my presence. 
At this stage in their life, I am their greatest love, right? And when I hold them in my arms, they can just completely doze off. And they're so content being in my arms, they don't even care that their brother is playing with the toy that they want, right? They are so satisfied and content just being held and being with me. And whether we realize it or not, our souls long for God. We were made for God and it is only in the presence of God that we can find hope every day. And we can be content no matter the circumstances. The good news is that God's presence is readily available for us. God doesn't passively watch and stand in the sidelines. God engages with us, strengthens us, comforts us, protects us. God is like a mother who holds her child. We can trust God and rest in him because he is the source of life. He's the source of what our hearts long for and need, and we will only experience true peace and contentment in the presence of God. Our hearts will only be, ever be satisfied in God's loving embrace. So if God's presence is something that is readily available to us, why don't we experience it every day? How can we experience God's presence today? First, we can experience his presence by humbling ourselves. In verse one, David says, my heart is not proud. Lord, my eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters that are too wonderful for me. He's saying that he does not think too highly of himself, nor does he look down upon others. But most of all, he has humbled himself before God. When it says, I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me, it is talking of the things that belong to the realm of God. There are things that David will never understand because he is not God. And God chooses to invite us into certain things, but also chooses to hide things at times and to keep things a mystery. The verb, I do not concern myself, also has the double meaning of to walk, which expresses the idea of one's posture and actions and attitude. David recognizes his limitations and his shortcomings and humbly surrenders that God is God and he is not. A posture of humility is vital because humility is the first step in entering God's presence. Humility is what leads a king to recognize that before God, he's like a child. That before God, he is nothing and has nothing and is completely dependent on God. Humility is recognizing our true selves before God and turning to him. And it helps us see ourselves in a clear relationship with God and leads us to know and worship God for who God is and not who we want God to be. In a fantasy book uh, I read a few years ago, uh, the main character, Feyre, is on a quest to save her world. Right? And on this quest, she has to look into a mirror and see her true self. And most people, when they look into this mirror, are filled with terror and fall into despair or go mad because they cannot bear or stand to see who they really are. However, when we see our true selves, we are seeing our true selves before a loving God. And we are able to recognize our depravity and our wickedness and shortcomings, but also receive the love of God as we come before him. And it doesn't lead us into despair or fear, but it gives us freedom and refreshment as we position ourselves right before God. 
C.S. Lewis describes humility as something that to even to get even near it, even for a moment, is like a drink of cold water to a man in a desert. It's refreshing and satisfying because as Lewis illustrates, we live our lives in layers and layers and layers of clothes, strutting about, trying to project this image of what we hope people will see about us. But humility is being able to take off those layers one by one and being able to be our true selves before God. And it is refreshing and satisfying. And there is so much freedom in being able to be our true selves. God calls us to be humble because God wants us to know him, to give himself to us and to fill us with him. As we recognize who we truly are before him and how much we need him in our lives. Humility directs us back to God and we receive the gift of deep intimacy and freedom in God's presence and it transforms our relationship with God, but it also transforms who we are and it transforms the, our relationship with others as we are able to look at one another with humility. Second, we can experience God's presence through quieting ourselves. Verse two says, but I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child, I am content. The psalmist intentionally learned how to calm and quiet his soul. And this is an active action in seeking God. God's presence is always available to us. God is with us always. And we are a ch and and whether a child is learning how to wean or already has been weaned, that child is in its mother's arms. The mother is constant. She does not change. Her presence and warm embrace is readily available. And God's presence is always available to us even in the chaos and in the noise and in the difficulties. But we're not always aware of what we have. We're not always aware of the comforting, loving presence and embrace that we have in every situation. When our lives are noisy and constantly filled with busyness, it's difficult to be aware of God's presence. We move from to-do list to do-do list to from distractions to distractions. But the invitation is to practice quieting ourselves and to find a space in our day to intentionally enter the presence of God and to climb into his lap and to snuggle with God. Right? To rest there, to be at peace there and to breathe a sigh of relief that we aren't God. That there might be chaos all around us, but God is holding us and whispering to us words of comfort in our hearts. God is always there, and it's our, but it's our lack of awareness that keeps us blind from him. Ezra and I, we went to Whistler, Canada for our honeymoon. And while we were there, we went whitewater rafting. We had gone before uh, in California, but the water levels were so low that we were mostly just floating around and getting stuck into rocks constantly because uh, the raft couldn't move. But in Canada, man, that was, the white water rafting there was like one wild adventure. The waters were just flowing and surging and just crashing into the rocks and we were going so fast and we were dipping and diving and paddling with all our might trying to get to our destination and we're so focused on our task and trying uh, to paddle and to make sure uh, that we got to the end that it was only when the waters had calmed down the raft uh, slowed down that we realized that we were in the center of this magnificent forest a forest with the greenest and densest trees that we had ever seen with these majestic mountain peaks surrounding us, all around us. It was only when things had slowed down, we realized where we were and what had been around us the entire time. 
Slowing down, calming, and quieting our souls helps us be aware of God's presence in our lives. And we can practice quieting ourselves by going on a walk in nature, by meditating on God's word, by praying and listening to God's voice, by singing songs or being in spiritual conversation with one another or saying a breath prayer. Uh, things that help us to just slow down and be consciously aware of God's presence. Uh, and it's when we are aware of God that we can step into his presence and enjoy him and find contentment that God is there with us. God is there just hugging us and embracing us in his loving arms. Finally, we can experience God's presence through the life of Jesus. This psalm was written by David, and it gives us a glimpse of David's heart and his spiritual life. But through the Holy Spirit, these psalms were also written to point us to a greater David, Jesus. David walked intimately with God and knew God, and he humbled himself and came to a place of resting with God, but he did so imperfectly. We see that in his life. But Jesus lived out the words of this psalm perfectly. While Jesus was one with God, he humbled himself by coming into this world. He was not proud or haughty, but he came to serve and the Lord of the universe, our great and mighty God, who had every right to be concerned with the great and marvelous things, chose to humble himself to the point of coming here as a baby, a helpless de baby who was completely dependent and needed to nurse and learn how to be weaned. And instead of seeing equality with God, something to be grasped, Jesus humbled himself to the point of death. And he quieted and calmed his soul as he wrestled with God in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he cried out and surrendered, but found contentment in the presence of God and who he was with God. But ultimately, Jesus gave up the presence his perfect of God. He gave up the presence of God. He gave up his perfect, precious, intimate unity with God so that we could be with him. So that we could have and receive the presence of God in our lives. Because at the cross, the curtain at the Holy of Holies in the temple tore in half. And the presence of God was no longer limited to a physical temple. And we no longer needed to journey as pilgrims to Jerusalem. But the Holy Spirit indwells with us now. Christ is with us now, and God's presence is not just around us always, but is within us. And Jesus lived out this psalm for us so that we could be one with him. And Jesus is saying, come, follow me. Follow me and place your hope in me because I am here with you and in you now and forevermore. And so sisters and brothers, today in this moment, may we find and have our hope in Jesus, knowing that he is with us always and we can enjoy and find our peace and contentment with him now and forevermore. Amen. Well, as we do each week, we will now take communion together online. If you're not familiar with what you need, you just need two things. You need a starch that can be bread or a cracker. Uh, you also need something to drink that can be water, juice, coffee. I'm going to give you a couple minutes to run to your kitchens to grab those elements. Meet me back here so that we can take those elements together. 
Sisters and brothers, this is food for the journey to which God has called us. Let our lives be nourished by the Lord himself as we celebrate together at this table. The Apostle Paul tells us that on the night on which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Paul goes on to tell us that in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Paul then reminds us that whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the death of Jesus until he comes again. This is the Lord's table. It is Jesus himself who invites you to this meal. The table, it is open to all who believe and have professed faith in Jesus Christ. So take and eat the body of Christ broken for you. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. the 
heartbeat of my life is to worship in your light. Your glory is so beautiful. Your glory is so beautiful. in your life your glory is so beautiful your glory is so beautiful your glory is so
Good morning, church. Good morning, C-Square. I am Reverend Henry O. Johnson, Jr., also known as Papa Pastor. As we go to prayer today, I just want to invite you, uh, as we dialogue with the Lord, there are some things that we need to deal with. As you notice, this little miniature coffin that is resting here. This was made for me by my neighbor some years ago. As you know, coffins are used to bury dead things. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to bury some dead things and denounce them in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Take a minute and just say, Amen. Can the church say, Amen? All right. Now that you're with me, Father, as we come before you today, we break racism. We break fear. We break humanism. We break all of the things, Lord, that are lifted up against you. Let them be cursed. Lord, we, we break the fact that we are no longer the old man and the old woman. They are dead. First Baptist Church is dead. Cambridge Community Fellowship Church is dead. It doesn't exist anymore. We are Central Square Church. Behold, the old things have passed away. All things, all things have become new. New attitude new mindset. Lord, as we come before you today, we bury these things. We bury lust. We we bury our, our issues that we have, Lord, when we uh, refuse to love one another. We bury those things. They are dead. We bury everything, Lord, that would impede us from looking like your son, Jesus. And so, Lord, as we pray, we lift up the name of Jesus. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his atoning work on the cross that no other sacrifices are needed because you died once and for all the just for the unjust. C Square is at an inflection point in its ministry, Lord. We are infants. We are an infant church, babies. We're still learning what we will be when we grow up. May we grow up into the image of Christ, our Savior. We denounce, Lord, every encumbrance that will come against us, that would impede our way from looking like Jesus, Lord. We break those traditions, Lord, those traditions that bind us. We break, Lord, with family traditions that bind us, Lord. You said that if a man or a woman was not willing to forsake all, that means mother, that means father, that means anything that we put in your place is idolatry. We denounce idolatry today. And so we come before you because we're not what we're going to be. Yet, we are becoming, uh, we are coming into our calling, into our destiny to love people. You said to me, Lord, that you were sending the nations to my house. You were sending the nations to my house. What that simply means is that we're not going to look alike. We're not going to think alike. We're coming from various parts of the world, but we're coming to your house. The house that you called us to be stewards of. And so, Lord, we come today and we just denounce everything that would impede, everything that will come up against. In the name of Jesus, let every man be a liar and let the Lord be true. And so, Father, we need to learn how to love one another. We need to learn how to respect one another. We need to learn how to respect the differences because we are each uniquely made. There is nothing you made that is the same. Not even two snowflakes, not even twins. They're not the same. They might look alike, 
but they are not the same. And so we come today, we respect each and everyone's individuality in Christ. And so the sin that besets us, Lord, you created us, male and female, Lord, that's who we are in Christ. And we celebrate manhood. We celebrate womanhood, Lord. In the name of Jesus, in this day, in this hour, we give you praise. We give you glory and honor. Amen, amen, and amen. Blessings to you. Fellowship time today will be at Dana Park at 11 o'clock. Dana Park at 11 o'clock. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you there.